Today we are talking to Captain Matthew McKinley in live in Afghanistan today, a pilot, a CH-53E pilot, a super stallion, and he joins us now from Camp Leatherneck. Uh, good morning, Captain. How are you? Um, good morning. How are you doing? Uh, we're, doing very, we're doing very well, and good to have you with us here today. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, and uh, how long have you been in the Marine Corps? I've been in the Marine Corps for uh, just over six years now. I originally come from North Little Rock, Arkansas, but uh, I was a military brat myself, so that's just uh, happened to be where I ended up after my dad retired from the Air Force. Uh, oh, so uh, what did he do in the Air Force? He was, uh, he was also a pilot. He flew uh, all sorts of stuff for, uh, for a while. So I would imagine he had a lot of encouragement for you to uh, pursue that route or, or, or not. He uh, he was kind of a little bit hands off, but he uh, he knew that that's something I wanted to do. So he certainly didn't discourage me, but uh, he he let me figure it out on my own, and he was very supportive of everything that uh, that I decided that I wanted to do. Well, is, with uh, that kind of in your blood, had you been flying before you actually came into the Marine Corps? Uh, I'd had a few experiences, just uh, you know, flying some Cessnas, but it wasn't something that that I had done a whole lot until I uh, got into the Marine Corps. Well, then uh, you're flying the big one now, though the CH-53. The that's Super right. Guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a yeah. very big bird. So, uh, how about that? How about, yeah. That what kind of progress do you have to make to become a pilot there? Uh, it's uh, pretty much a standard pipeline. We all go down to Pensacola, Florida, and learn the basics of you know how how airplanes fly, how they work, um, how the weather works, and and all that that fun stuff that uh, takes a lot of books. And then, uh, then we start out flying some fixed wing for a few months. You learn how uh, how to do that. And then, if you uh, you want to be a helicopter pilot, and you get selected for it. Then you move on flying the uh, Bell 206 helicopters, uh, kind of like all the news choppers you see flying around. Oh yeah. And then uh, once you do that, you, you get selected for uh, for something else. And I I happen to be lucky enough to to get the CH 53. Yeah, it is quite an honor, and we're uh, glad that you could uh, tell us about it here uh, there in Camp Leatherneck. Um, I know that you have a number of them there, but are you? Uh, do you stay with one? This I, I just don't know for my own edification. Do you stay with uh, one helicopter? Do you always fly the same one? Uh, normally, yeah, you stick with whatever you're initially assigned. But there are opportunities to uh, lateral move into another community if that's something you desire. But uh, I know from personal experience, most people tend to fall in love with their first aircraft and they want to stick with it for their career. And that's many- certainly been the case with me. What's the what's the crew like for that? How many in the crew for that? Uh, we got two pilots uh, sitting up front, sitting next to each other, and then uh, up to uh, three or four uh, crew chiefs and aerial observers in the back, depending on what the mission is. Um, as little as one, but uh, as many as four or five. If we got something that's more complex and we need a lot of people in the back to help us out, and you know, it's a really big helicopter, and I, I can't see behind me, so they uh, they help us out with that. What kind of missions have you flown out of uh, Camp Leatherneck so far? Now, most of the, most of the stuff that we're doing is uh, bringing supplies out to the troops at the uh, forward operating bases that uh, don't have access to uh, everyday supplies. So we bring them food and water mainly, but uh, we also bring them you know repair equipment for their gear. And then uh, one of the more enjoyable things I do is bringing them their mail. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you know that is a uh, it is something and, and the that you can carry a great amount of cargo in that can't you? Absolutely, uh, we can carry a whole lot. You know, we're limited by uh, by basically the space in the aircraft and and what they've got and uh, what we can move with the uh, the equipment we have. But we can carry a whole lot of stuff. That's amazing. You know, the um, uh, it's quite a bit of history there, too. Certainly the Marines made, the I think, the deepest uh, amphibious incursion ever with a CH-53's establishing camp in uh, in 2001 in Afghanistan. Yes, they did, yeah. The, uh, the CH-53's had a real big part in that, moving from the, uh, from the ocean into uh, the Kandahar area for Camp Rhino. Uh, and so, again, that's quite a historical uh, mission and, and a continuation of that mission as well. And you mentioned about being a uh, military brat, so you have other family members uh, that have been in the military too? Yes, yes. My father was in the Air Force. Uh, my father-in-law was also a uh, an Army helicopter pilot in Vietnam. And so, uh, you know, listening to both of them tell their stories, getting a lot of a lot of history out of them. Uh, so those birds are in all of your blood, I guess, it looks like. Yeah. Yes, they are. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, flying. Uh, your, you mentioned about your uncle flying. Did he uh, fly in uh, Vietnam? Uh, I had a friend who was an associate who associate who who flew in Vietnam, and he said one of the most enjoyable things that was was Mail Day and Beer Day. That was when uh, when the, when the pilots <laughs> brought that in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now it's just uh, Mail Day. Not yeah. not so much on the beer, but yeah. we uh, we save that for when we get home. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but again, uh, flying this, of course, you are, uh, tell me about your unit. What unit are you with at, and uh, out of uh, New River, right? I'm with, uh, yes, Marine Heavy Helicopter Squadron 464. We're uh, based out of New River, North Carolina, and uh, we've actually got half of our squadron here, and then we're augmented with uh, half of a squadron from uh, from Miramar and uh, California, and that's uh, HMH 462. They're the, they're the heavy haulers and we're the condors on the east coast and they uh, they put us together and we're we're getting the job done out here yeah uh, any uh, rivalry in between units there uh it's it's all friendly you know they they came to our squadron and we've got our uh, our COs out here and you know but it's it's all friendly and we we know that when we need to get the job done we we team up and our our air crews work together just uh just as well as anybody else does to uh get the mission accomplished yeah, and speaking of that mission, and we've emphasized this with all our interviews, that um, we're just amazed how when we talk to people, no matter what rank, uh, is that they are very focused on their mission. And today we have the privilege of talking with uh, Captain Matthew McKinley, again uh, talking about flying the CH-53. And uh, it is something that uh, I would imagine in your deployment there, and I understand this is your first time in Afghanistan, that you are noticed that everybody is yes, quite is. focused, quite focused on their mission. Yes, yes. Yeah, we're uh, we're all driven to to get the job done because we know that uh, if we don't get our mission, then all the guys on the ground out the uh, that are that are living a lot rougher than we are, they can't get their job done if we can't uh, can't get ours done. Uh, where are you from originally? Uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, understand that you went to the Naval Academy. Yes, I did. So you had a chance to follow uh, in sports. You follow Arkansas, the Razorbacks, and you also follow the midshipmen there too. I do. Yeah, the uh, the Hogs are doing real well right now. Just have that one loss to Alabama on their record, mm-hmm. and then uh, Navy uh, Navy's not doing so hot lately, but uh, still rooting for them through thick and thin. Well, I have to tell you that uh, I have a son that goes to East Carolina, and uh, we all kind of agree, although we say it quietly around here, that uh, that Navy got hosed on the final touchdown of that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a, it. Was a good game, though. Yeah, it was, but uh, I think it was the wrong call there. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, you, you do have a chance to pursue some of that, and at least to follow some of your favorites, and your other guys do too. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, we have uh, Armed Forces Network out here, uh, limited. We get to uh, watch some of the games. Sometimes they're late, and then uh, when we get time to sit behind a computer, and we can uh, we can get on ESPN or whatever other sports network uh, website and and check up all our, uh, our on our teams. Okay, good. Uh, and you have uh, family back in this area, I understand too. Yes. Okay. Yes, my wife and uh, and son are back home. I know that uh, probably want to. Uh, do you have get? Do you get a good opportunity to communicate with them? Oh yes, um, not as much as on previous deployments because we're working a lot more. But uh, I get to call home, you know, a couple times a week if the uh, the schedule allows it, and definitely emails and uh, a lot a lot of that during the during the day when I've got time. And uh, when I'm back back getting ready to go to sleep, you know, downloading videos of my son that my wife will send out. So that's. One thing technology is uh, real great for is staying connected with uh, my son growing up back home, even though I'm out here. Yeah, I, I know. I, I really cannot imagine what that would be like. Uh, and uh, and God bless you for uh, for the job that you're doing and knowing that you have to be away from your family for this uh, amount of time. But when you are all together, what do you like to do? Uh, we like to, uh, you know, standard family stuff. My wife and I like to go shopping for food and mm-hmm. picking out what we're going to eat for the next week or so. And we're uh we're big into the gardening too we got our our little garden plot in our backyard and we take care of that and right before i left my son was starting to get into playing with dirt so hopefully he gets a little <laughs> bit of a green thumb too yeah playing with dirt that'll be something you'll probably do for a number of years and so you'll have that opportunity so. yeah uh but uh the uh i would imagine then quite the contrast in the climate there in afghanistan as to uh, you haven't picked out a little garden spot there i would imagine 
No, no, not really uh, room for a garden out here. It's pretty dry, uh, and uh, it was really hot when we first got here, but it's it's slowly started to cool off. It's not quite as unbearable as it used to be, uh, but it's it's still really dry. I would imagine you'll have some pretty big contrast in the weather there, too, in an arid climate like that. You'll get some pretty cold nights coming up here shortly. Yeah, there uh, there's a few nights the uh, last few weeks that have been getting a little bit chilly, especially when you're flying up at altitude. It, uh, it can get a little bit cold, especially in the back. But uh, talking with some people that have been out here before, it, come, uh, come December, January, it's going to get real cold. We're talking to CH-53 helicopter pilot, again, um, Captain Matthew McKinley, uh, who is stationed out of uh, New River and currently at Camp Leatherneck in Afghanistan here on live at, on Afghanistan here on the talk station. Uh, as we uh, talk a little bit more here, again, about um, your, your job there as well uh, as a helicopter pilot, is this something that can be a career for you as a helicopter pilot? Is this something that you envision staying in with? Um, not really sure. I'm, I'm definitely going to continue flying helicopters as long as I'm having fun with it, and uh, I, I enjoy it a lot, and I want to continue doing that throughout uh, throughout my time in the Marine Corps. And then, you know, it, it may transition to something in the uh, the civilian world when I decide that it's uh, time for me to hang up my hat in the, in the Marine Corps, but I, uh, I don't really know right now. Well, I know at New River you also share, obviously, the base with the, with the Osprey. Is that, have you been able to ride in one? Is that of interest? I have uh, not yet had the uh, the opportunity to ride in one. I know several people that have, and uh, they can get up going pretty fast. So that's that's a unique experience, but I have, have not yet experienced it myself. Uh, Captain uh, Matthew McKinley again with us, live in Afghanistan here on the talk station. Uh, and we've been talking a little bit about home and uh, and also about the base. And one of the things we always ask, kind of a traditional question we ask, is uh, how's the food? <laughs> I was hoping we wouldn't talk about that. The uh the food is not the greatest but it, it it's certainly adequate to uh to sustain us while we're out here. Now, uh, I, I, there's I a lot of rice. That, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that there's steak and lobster on the on the weekends. Uh it it all depends on what chow hall you go to and when you have the time to go there. Yeah. I know uh, out here on the flight line we're we're pretty busy maintaining the aircraft, fixing them so we can go out and fly them, so we don't always don't always get good opportunities, but every now and then you do hear about steak and lobster on the base. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's the, you know, have, and all in all, that's kind of the first semi-negative report we've heard on food, so I guess all, not too bad. <laughs> uh, but, uh, again, uh, Captain, as uh, you talk about uh, maintaining your aircraft, uh, I, uh, I can't imagine that uh, how crucial that must be for you and, and what kind of um, – um, what kind of support is there for maintenance of the aircraft there? Uh, we uh, we brought a full squadron's worth of maintainers. We got a couple hundred Marines that work in the uh, the maintenance department and all sorts of different shops, anywhere from uh, repairing the airframe to, to keeping the avionics and all the computers up uh, up and running. But then we've we've also got some other uh, support units on the base that help us with you know getting our our larger parts that we don't keep in stock. And it's uh, it's a lot of work, probably thirty to forty man hours per uh, per single flight hour that we have. Mm, wow! So it's 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 a good uh, good bit of work, but they uh, they do a great job, and I have absolute uh, faith in their abilities to keep me flying. Mm. It, when you are, oh, I'm just thinking that it, kind of an analogy to that for folks listening here might might even be the NASCAR driver as he communicates with his crew. Is that is your communication with your crew a big part of that? Oh yes, definitely, and especially with uh, with a really big aircraft. Uh, I, I said before, what I see out in front of me in the cockpit is is only a small portion of of what's going on. So if, if I want to do anything, you know, if I want to turn the aircraft or, or do something, I absolutely rely on the guys in the back to, uh, to let me know if it's clear. And, you know, they're, they're absolutely crucial when it comes to loading cargo and they're, they're the real expert when it comes to that, making sure that the cargo gets loaded correctly and, and efficiently so that we can, we can get the, get the most done and, uh, not compromise the safety of the aircraft either. As big as a CH-53E is, uh, can can you tell the difference when it's not loaded correctly? I mean, is there a is there a sensitivity to the aircraft? 
there there is a little bit you know if you get uh get a lot of real heavy stuff in the back then the nose rides a little bit high and it's not as comfortable flying um and so that's that's one of the things we try to do is get the heavy cargo loaded in the middle uh kind of ma- get the center of gravity um uh, where it's supposed to be at and so that's that's something that we uh we train to and making sure that everything gets loaded correctly so that we're doing it safely I mean, I mean, I would imagine uh, even with all the instrumentation, the computers that you have, your ears probably tell you a lot too. I mean, just he- hearing the air. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you, you get a lot from the uh, the hear the hearing the aircraft, feeling it, how it's flying, uh, just with your interaction with the controls, and then even to some extent uh, some smells too, because you know if if something's leaking, you're going to pick up a smell on that. Now, is the CH fifty three E is that the Super Stein, Is that something that you also do simulator training with? And do you ever do kind of uh, off time training with that as well? Yes, yes, we do a lot of simulator training back home, um, keeping our proficiency because it's a lot cheaper to maintain a simulator than it is to uh, to maintain the aircraft. So we'll we'll go through a lot of uh, training scenarios with the uh, with the young pilots, and that's something that we. Uh, Using the, the the simulators, we can we can train to things that we can't train to in the aircraft because you're not going to just shut off all three engines while you're flying and and practice that emergency procedure. But that's something that we can do in the simulator uh, very easily. Mm. Is that um, uh, does your crew generally stay uh, together? Have you been with them for a while? Uh, there there are some guys that I've been on several deployments with, but uh, when it comes to you know day-to-day flying we uh we rotate around several times we fly with pretty much everybody else what other deployments have you been on i've been to the horn of africa to uh djibouti and then i've also been on deployment to uh south america and uh, central america on a uh, navy ship Mm. Uh, the contrast i would imagine is pretty large between that kind of deployment and what you're doing now Yes, it is. The uh, Central South America is very green, very uh, very humid, uh, also hot, but uh, but it, it's just a lot different uh, than you go to Djibouti. You know, Africa is actually very similar to Afghanistan. It's very desert-like, and then uh, Afghanistan has got a lot of a lot of mountainous terrain, and then it's you know very very arid environment with uh, a lot of heat in the summertime. Does that does the aircraft behave differently in that kind of a difference in humidities, for example? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's the uh, high temperatures and high altitudes will uh, will affect the engines and the and the, the rotor system, so they're not as efficient. And so that's something that we train to as well. You know, we we've got all the calculations to make sure, you know figure out how much we can lift on a given day, and then we uh, we make sure that we're not overloading ourselves so that we uh, we can still still take off and land and have sufficient power to get us out of any uh, scenarios that might arise. You know, uh, I was thinking about all the technical aspects that must be involved with a CH-53 Super Stay and then more than, and now all the electronics over its years, it's been around for a while now, but uh, over its years, I would imagine the computer parts, even since you've been there, the computers have been all upgraded. Yeah, they have. They've uh, a lot of it still with the original 1970s technology when it was designed and it was designed very well by Sikorsky, um, and it's still doing its job, but a lot of the other systems have been upgraded uh, throughout time, and they've, they've put on some more stuff in the aircraft to make it uh, more efficient and also to uh, aid us in our job. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of discussion over the last years around here, too, about training facilities, et cetera, and do you get a ch- uh, chance, uh, I guess a simulator would do this as well, but uh, real-time, uh, nighttime uh, land- landing and training? Yes, yeah, that, that's one of the things we train to a lot back home uh, is uh, nighttime training. And uh, I'm a night systems instructor, so one of my jobs is to take a new pilot into the, uh, in, the, in the fleet and, and train him up on how to use the night vision equipment that we have in the aircraft and to, uh, to be able to, to navigate around at nighttime and also to uh, effectively employ the aircraft at night so that we can still, uh, still do our jobs. I think a lot of folks around here don't really understand that completely about the nighttime training because when you're training, especially if you if you have to, for some reason, fly in the middle of the ocean, you are in complete darkness at night. I mean, you don't have any lights around to kind of give you orientation. Yeah, it is. When you're, uh, when you're out over the ocean at nighttime, it's uh, a very unique experience because as soon as you cross over the end of the water, 
there is nothing out in front of you. And you may see the occasional buoy or a, or a boat or something out there, but it's complete blackness. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between where the sky and the, uh, the ocean meet. So you're really relying a lot on your, your training and your instruments to tell you where you're at in the, uh, the sky and then uh, trying to find that boat that you're going out to. I just say that in support of, uh, I know that we've been here at the station, but uh, for our listeners to, to be in support of those kinds of training facilities. When we talk about uh, outlying landing fields, uh, no different for aircraft and for helicopters, but you really do need a spot where you can really train in that complete kind of darkness. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's absolutely crucial, and we've we've got a few outlying fields in the uh, the Jacksonville area that assist us with that kind of training, and uh, and also using those areas out in the ocean for the ships to go, so that we can uh, we can practice those nighttime uh, operations. Uh, now, in uh, in your where you are in Afghanistan, uh, is this uh, pretty much all kinds of all day and night sorts of uh, missions that you're carrying out? Yes, yeah, we we operate pretty much 24 hours out here, um, day or night. You know, the, the schedules we we make it so that you know one schedule starts during the daytime and finishes at nighttime, and then the other one starts at nighttime, finishes in the daytime, and we uh, we do a little bit of everything out here. Yeah, I, I would imagine that that kind of training too uh, is difficult to to duplicate even back in the states. The sort of uh, terrain that you have to cover and that you have to cover and look out for. Uh, there, not only flatlands but mountains and all kinds of uh, arid terrain. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult in uh, eastern North Carolina to, to <laughs> simulate mountainous flying, but uh, we we managed to do it. You know, we also uh, will send out detachments to uh, to other parts of the country, like uh, Twenty Nine Palms. There's a uh, really good training and uh, training base out there to uh, to help train us up. And uh, we actually went out there before we came here so that everybody from North Carolina could experience that mountainous terrain and, and operating in a mountain environment and in a desert environment that you don't really get when you're in North Carolina. As a uh, night uh, if flying instructor, I would imagine you can uh, um, empathize or, uh, with the young pilot that's coming in that might have a little sweaty palms about flying at night the first time. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, and I remember when I was a when I was a young pilot, it was a little bit nerve wracking flying at night, and you uh, you really learn to trust your uh, trust your equipment. You you learn how it works and how it's going to help you uh, stay airborne, and and now it's my job to to help impart that upon the the young guys so that they uh, can get that experience, so that someday that they can they can step up and fill the role that I'm filling now. You, you, you talked about one of the most enjoyable missions that you have is flying the mail, and we think about it in this day of the electronic age that there may not be as much, but there's still those care packages that you bring from home. I would imagine that they are uh, they are watching very carefully for that flight to come into the outlying base. Absolutely, yeah. Email is uh, is really nice. You can stay in touch with your family and friends back home, but there's uh, nothing quite as enjoyable as is getting that mail and opening up a letter from home or even a package with some goodies in it because uh, it can really brighten your day when you open up a box and you know it's got some uh, got some goodies for all your friends and you can uh, you can share that or you can uh, you can enjoy it yourself. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with uh, scoring a few points with the guys who are maintaining the aircraft here if you can uh, if you can share Not that at all. Yeah. That's right. Uh, but again, we're talking to Captain uh, Matthew uh, McKinley who is uh, sharing with us some of the experiences of flying the uh, Super Stallion, the CH-53E, and also in deployment in Afghanistan here on the program on Live in Afghanistan on the talk station. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, again, I know you have family locally. You want to give a shout-out to them. Hopefully they're listening and tuning in. Yes, uh, to my wife, Marsha, I love you very much. Thank you for everything that you're doing. You're uh, doing a great job raising our son. And uh, to my 11-month-old son, Boyd, I uh, can't wait to see you again. Hopefully you'll be walking by the time I get home, and uh, I'll see you soon. And uh, we hope that is soon, and no, it uh, really probably can't be soon enough. But uh, we will, we honor you for your service, that you all that you and your fellow Marines and sailors are doing in Afghanistan and all over the world uh, where you serve, too. And we just want to thank you for that. But also want to encourage our folks to think about those packages. It's time to get those done and that you can send a little touch of home uh, back to folks. There are all kinds of programs that are doing this. Contact your local Chamber of Commerce. They almost always have a program going on. Uh, many other uh, folks, USO, Red Cross, all involved in that as well, too. And uh, keep our support going for our, our men and women who are serving 
for us in uniform in faraway places. And, and again, uh, Afghanistan being as remote as they get right now, and uh, we uh, certainly do appreciate Captain McKinley, all that you do, and your service to our country. And uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you and meeting you when you come home. Absolutely. I, uh, my pleasure serving, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing everybody. All right, that'll wrap it up for us. And I appreciate you being with us. It's uh, right. enjoyable talking with you. And, uh, and, and, again, right. and again, uh, your Navy got cheated on that, on that play. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we've gone yeah. and looked, looked at that and says, no, that's not what the rules say. No, uh, he was inbound. He was a runner. He extended over the uh, goal line. It should have been a touchdown. But, you know, uh, yeah. my, my son announces for the band at halftime, so he's there at all those games. Okay. Uh, so it's, uh, it's always fun. But, th- again, thanks for being with us. Look forward to seeing you when you get home. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, thanks. Bye. Um, just for the record, um, tell me uh, your name, your rank. You don't have to give me your serial number. And uh, the fact that uh, you know that portions of uh, your voice will be broadcast on the radio in Detroit. Not to mention over the internet. Now that's uh, that's fine with you, isn't it? Yes. Well, Corporal, let me grab my fact sheet here. I've jotted down a couple of notes. I'm very pleased uh, to be talking to Corporal Leonard Graham, a proud U.S. Marine serving our country in Afghanistan. Um, one of the questions is, of course, uh, being out of country, out of the USA country, overseas for both Veterans Day. And the Marine Corps birthday, one of the biggest holidays on the year for all the leathernecks. What, what does it mean to you to, to have this added to the already excitement of Veterans Day and the Marine birthday? Well, it's a great, great feeling because just knowing that I'm out here with the past great leaders of the Marine Corps has been out of country, serving their country, feel like I'm doing the utmost greatest thing by serving my country and doing things I can to defend it. How long have you been deployed to Afghanistan? Uh, since August. Do you have a... Uh, uh, this year. Yeah, this past this year. So, do you have a date yes. certain when you expect to come back home? Do you, do you have pretty much of a date certain to come home? Oh, uh, no. Oh, uh, no. So what do you miss, uh, obviously outside of mom and dad or along with them, what do you miss about being so far from home, uh, especially as we get closer to the traditional holidays, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and so on? I just miss uh, everyday life, uh, just getting to go to, go to the malls, shopping, um, watching TV whenever I can, watching uh getting the updates on sports. Is it really dangerous where you are? I mean, there's no place safe for Americans in Afghanistan. I know that. Uh, is How would you rate the area where you serve as, as, as far as you having to really be alert to protect yourself? Uh, it's, it's pretty... It's not that bad. It's just you always have to stay alert. It's just having an alertness that's 24-7, so it's not, it's not bad, but you still have to have alertness. So Now, as I'm talking to you, it's about 60 degrees and kind of rainy here in Detroit. Before the end of the week, it might. There will be a little snow in the air around here. Upper Peninsula, Michigan's got a great big blizzard. So that's our, that's our weather story here in Michigan. How does that compare with the kind of weather you're having right now in Afghanistan? Oh, right now in Afghanistan, it's cooling down. It's, when I first got out here, it was very, very hot. It was just windy, having sandstorms. It's just, just been hot. It's cooling down now. So, What exactly do you do when you're on duty? What is your job to make sure that the mission is accomplished while you are specifically on duty during your day over there? My duty is just to make sure that the communications stay up, 
as far as our communications with other units, we just make sure that uh, comm stays up, that nothing's go down. If it if it do go down, uh, try to get it back up in a uh, timely manner. Now I see your home base is Cherry Point, North Carolina, which of course is a big air station. So are are you uh, involved with an aviation mission? Ah, uh, yes, somewhat, yes. So when the jets come back in after patrol or, or being sent out uh, on a mission, then your part is to make sure, well, of course, make sure they get in the air safely, and even more importantly, they get back down safely. So you're involved in that every day, yes. I would take it. Yes. I, I think a lot of young people are intrigued by the idea that we know how tough the Marine Corps, at least that's what the legend is, Marine Corps is the toughest thing they'll ever do in their life. On the other hand, I think that some people will say, you know, I wonder if I've got the, you know, I've got what it takes to be a Marine because anyone who, could, who you know, who can proudly serve their, their time as a leatherneck never has to uh, ever be questioned again about your ability to, to, to really put out when you're on the spot. Did How did that, when you were making your decision to join the Marines, were, were you, uh, you know, attracted by the idea that you would be pushed probably beyond every limit that you'd ever thought of before? Were you nervous about that? How did all that play in to when you were making your decision? I was very excited when I um, chose to do it. it was, I was kind of nervous at first, leaving home, um, being away for four years. It, it just became, it became a great decision in my life. After I went through boot camp, I learned that I made one of the best decisions in my life. I meet, uh, met a lot of great people out here, uh, considering my brothers and sisters. It's just a great feeling to be in the Marine Corps. Was the boot camp as tough as you thought it would be, tougher, or did you just breeze right through it? It's actually kind of tougher than what I thought it would be. For the three months I was there, it was actually it was tougher than I, was, I thought it was going to be. Do you, do you have much of an opportunity to wear that tremendously striking, gorgeous Marine dress uniform in, in that, you know, you are in a combat zone? Do you, do you still have a chance to dress up in your in your dress blues over there? Uh, no, no, no. So maybe that's one thing you're looking forward to, along with getting back home and, you know, seeing your loved ones all safe and sound when you are deployed back to the USA. Is that something you're also looking forward to, getting those dress blues with a blood stripe uh, on the pants and everything and, uh, you know, being able to to really wear the, the, the Class A uniform again? Yes. I'm definitely, that's one of my favorite uniforms to wear, and I can't wear it. It makes me feel proud to serve my country, so I'm really looking forward to wearing it. Hey, as, as far as staying in touch with your mom and your dad and your other loved ones, uh, you know, back here, back here in Michigan, uh, do you have a lot of opportunity to, you know, keep up with your loved ones, uh, you know, through electronic, you know, all the communications we have these days, Skype or whatever? Uh, yes, I do. Do you, do you get to email much? Do you, do you actually get to go on video face-to-face? -face? I mean, you know, other veterans who are listening from, you know, even, even fairly recent wars, I mean, the ability to stay in touch is so precious to guys on the line. And, I mean, for like World War II veterans that get mail, you know, when they were on the firing line maybe once a month, and, and that was always, the, you know, the best day of them all. And this is just such a revolution. Do you get a chance to talk, like, even face-to-face -face with your parents very often? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I have a, have a, on my laptop, I can have a face-to-face -face with my uh, parents, talk to them. I try to talk to them every day if I can, depending on my schedule or work, but I mostly talk to them every single day. And I see where you also are a grad of Wald Lake Western High School. You know, Wald Lake Western is still in the fight for the state uh, high school football playoffs uh, heading toward Ford Field on Thanksgiving weekend. Um, you you still a fan? Yes. So if Wald Lake Western wins the championship, You'll know it was dedicated to Corporal Graham, right? 
<laughs> yes. Hey, Corporal, it's been great talking to you over there. Uh, you know, God love you and keep you safe, and we'll be looking forward to a great Detroit homecoming, whenever that, whenever that may be, and, you know, many, many Thanksgivings and Christmases with you and your family. God love you, and thanks so much from all of us over here on the home front, especially because Veterans Day is just a little while away. Thanks for talking to me today. Thank you. Okay, Corporal, be safe, and I'm looking forward to talking to you again stateside. Till that time, then. So long. Okay. All right, I am going to start recording. If you could tell me uh, your name and uh, a title for you, please. Okay. My name is Corporal Shaba. All right, very good. And uh, as we're, you know, why don't we first start with, t tell me about uh, your experiences overseas. What what have you done um, Sort of give me some background on, on you to start here. Okay, well, um, this is my first deployment, um, and um, we just were out here supporting all the aircraft, all the helicopters, all the planes, making sure they're ready to go when they're needed. All right, and where are you from? I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And, and you said this is your uh, first deployment. Uh, what made you want to... Uh, uh, go go into uh, the service here. Well, growing up, I always loved watching all the movies and stuff, and um, I decided once I graduated, I went into college for a year, and I decided to do something different where I could challenge myself, so I joined the Marine Corps. It, what was your family's reaction? My mother, being you know one of her daughters, she wasn't very excited, but my dad was very, very excited when I went to him with the news. And uh, what what do you want people to uh, think about as we come up here on uh, Veterans Day? I just want um, people to remember all the service members, all the ones that are out here, the ones that have been out here before. You know, um, a lot of people don't really know what we're doing, and it's just it's a good thing. And just remember, even the ones that have passed away, you know, this is a day to remember everyone that's out there serving the country. What what's your biggest challenge from day to day? Do you think? I think um, just supporting one another out here, keeping ourselves positive. You know, knowing that it's going to be time to go home to our families soon. When when is your uh, time to to come home? And uh, have what have you talked to your family recently? Yes, um, I get to talk to my uh, sisters almost every day uh, with email, but we'll be home in a couple months. Uh, you mentioned you have you have sisters. Uh, what's your relationship with them, and were were they supportive of your uh, decision to go into the Marines? They were they were very supportive. Um, they don't want me to go to leave them because we grew up together. We're all two years apart, but you know they support me. One hundred percent. All right, very good. Anything else you want to uh, make sure uh, people hear from you or that people know as we uh, come up here on Veterans Day? I think just keep supporting us out here. Um, we're all here for everyone there, so just keep everyone in their prayers. Very good. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. And welcome to Live from Afghanistan, as today we speak with uh, Lance Corporal Jared Fisk, who joins us live from the forward position at 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing Forward in Afghanistan. And hello, uh, Corporal, how are you? Not too bad, sir. How are we doing today? Uh, we're doing very well, and it's uh, great to be able to talk to you there in Afghanistan. And uh, tell me, which uh, which base? Are you at Camp Leatherneck? Is that where you are? I am, yes. I'm at Camp Leatherneck. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, getting into the Marine Corps. How long have you been in the Marine Corps? 
Uh, I have been in the Marine Corps for two years. For two years? Actually, this month. Okay. And is this uh, your first deployment then? Yes, it is. First trip out. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, Camp Leatherneck. What do you think of the uh, place? Uh, I'm sure it has to be unlike anything you've ever been in. It it certainly is. It's uh, it's kind of what I expected coming out here. It's very desert-like during the summers. It's very, very warm, a lot of sandstorms. Um, but other than that, we got a lot of stuff out here, a lot of good stuff that I didn't expect. So it's it's a little easier to get through than uh, what some of the other Marines are working with. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about what you do there in the Marine Corps. What is uh, your MOS? My MOS, I am a uh, data systems technician. I handle all the connections through Internet, uh, telephone, radios. I set up all the, uh, pretty much it's basic communication so that everybody can speak with each other. So so I can imagine uh, you have uh, uh, someone that says, uh, Lance Corporal Fisk, can you come over here and tell me why I can't get this computer working? Yes, sir. We get that every day. I imagine you do. Uh, and so we go over there and we fix it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, w- uh, I would also imagine, and you tell me, uh, uh, that you are dealing with a little bit different situation than you would be, say, with just a uh, local uh, network inside of an office or something. Absolutely, sir. We're, it's uh, much wider. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what that means. I mean, you provide uh, data links, or you're keeping people uh, uh, in uh, communication. Is that how it works? Yes, sir. We uh, we we provide pretty much all the basic services, uh, with, such as internet. Um, uh, let's see, telephone. Uh, any issues they have, we we communicate with uh, all the other uh, Marine Corps aircraft wing bases in Afghanistan, or most of them, and uh, we handle all of that. We're, I work with the uh, MWHS-2, which is the headquarters, mm-hmm. and so we provide all the services for everybody below us for 2nd Marine Air Wing. So, uh, again, if, you, if somebody's uh, shockwave uh, crashes on them, you know what to do with that then? Pretty much, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we deal with a whole bunch of different issues. Uh, well, uh, and let's uh, let me uh, ask you a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? I am from a little town in Massachusetts called Conway, in the western portion. The western portion of Massachusetts. And uh, did you always want to be a Marine? Is this something that uh, has driven you since uh, since you can remember? I have. Uh, my grandfather was in the army. He's really the only one in my family who's been in the services. And uh, he's a big idol for me, so, and I wanted to try something different. I wanted to be, the Marine Corps always just stuck out to me. I always wanted to be a Marine. I tried college. College was fun, but I just had that drive to become a Marine, so. Well, I think uh, as we. That's what I did. As as we also have uh, talked recently with your uh, Sergeant Major uh, there who says that, uh, he likes those kind of Marines that, that have driv- are driven, that really w- have wanted to be one for a long time. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's an honor and privilege, especially today. Well, well uh, t- today, of course, uh, as we're recording this, is the Marine Corps' birthday. So have you been participating in celebrations on that? Uh, yes, we have, sir. I, I, uh, we had a little cake-cutting ceremony. It's one of the... Uh, Marine Corps traditions where the oldest Marine passes a piece of cake to the youngest Marine. And it was just a nice little break. And it was nice to know that we still uphold those traditions even in a combat zone. So it was nice. Uh, indeed. I say you're from a little town in Massachusetts. That must uh, make you a uh, fan of uh, maybe the New England Patriots? Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right, well, they're 5-3, and three, and uh, by the time actually this airs, uh, they will have played the Jets on Sunday night. What do you uh, uh, Give us your prediction, and by the time this airs, we'll know if it's true. My prediction is that the Patriots will absolutely beat the Jets. <laughs> uh, my, my score 
I'm I'm thinking around 32-24. Ah, uh, there you go. That would that'd be a that'd be an yeah. excellent win. Yes, sir. It's gonna be an offensive showing. Patriots yeah. are uh, a little upset after last week, so. That's yes, indeed they and they should be. And uh, and how about Buffalo? A surprise there in the AFC East. Yeah, absolutely. I I did not expect that Buffalo came out of nowhere, but it, it's good. I'm glad to see them playing so well. Just not against the Patriots. <laughs> Five and three. Uh, I don't know if you've had the news there. Albert Hainsworth let go, picked up by Tampa Bay, uh, and uh, people are wondering if Ocho Cinco is going to be next. Uh, uh. Yeah, I I haven't really heard too much about that, but uh, I don't know. I, I guess I can. It wouldn't be a mistake to let him go, but. He's a great player. He's a great football player. He knows the game real well. It's just I don't think he fits in with the Patriots. We need uh and I, we're we're definitely going to miss Albert Hainsworth. Um he was a great player, so Well, uh on that uh Kyle Love, I think he's a second year player. He's he's doing real well. He's going to step in. But um also um uh Brady says he likes Ocho Cinco. So, you know, we'll get that. Now, that's enough uh, perhaps about the um about the uh, Patriots. So just curious now, too, if you're, again, up in that area, you must also have been, have been following the Boston Red Sox. That may be a sore subject to bring up right now. Uh, yes, sir. A little bit sore. <laughs> I made pre postseason predictions, and they most certainly did not follow through. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, hey, I just read, too, uh, that they just interviewed uh, uh, Sandy Alomar Jr. for the possible manager's job, but there's uh, several out there that they're looking at. Um, so we'll see what happens with them. But just since I knew that you're from uh, New England, I thought um, thought I'd bring that up, bring you up to speed on some of those uh, bits of news. Do you get a chance to stay in touch with home and with uh, with things like that that are going on? You and your fellow Marines. We do. We get we get a decent amount of time to be able to connect with our families. Um, it's tough with the time difference, but um, most. Most of us make it work, even if it's just a, a phone call every two weeks or be able to pop on Skype every once in a while. But uh, we do. We, we, we get the resources, and it's nice to catch up and hear news from home. I would imagine your grandfather probably just shocked by the even the ability to do what we're doing now, just to talk live like this. He, he is indeed. I, uh, I Skyped back with my family, I'd say about two weeks ago and he was there and he had no idea what was going on all he knew that was that he saw me and i was in afghanistan and he was in the united states and he was just yeah he was he was shocked like he said yeah that, that is kind of a culture shock i think for a generation but speaking of which again as we're recording this on the marine corps birthday uh the, you do stand on a uh, hallowed tradition of a lot of marines that have come before you and and that must uh that must be evident. I mean, you guys must be aware of that pretty much all the time. Absolutely. We're always constantly reminded of it. Um, it's ne- it's always in the back of our heads, back of our minds. Um, we try to we try to follow through with those traditions. Uh, we a lot of the stuff we do out here are based on those traditions, so we like to keep it going. Yeah, indeed, and as you um, as you do your job there too, it is something about not only doing your job but also uh, fulfilling the mission of the Marine Corps in, in many ways, and and uh, and even in missions that were not even thought of by many Marines years ago to be this forward deployed in Afghanistan. But let's talk a little bit about uh, again about what you do because uh, these days, as we are talking now and as we communicate in so many different ways. Those lines of communication are so different, obviously, from your grandfather's era, but also so different from even 10, 15 years ago. Keeping up on the training must be must be pretty daunting. You have to, I would imagine, have to stay up on that um, uh, pretty regularly. Uh, yes, sir. We're constant, constantly getting new training. Um, as technology uh, increases, so does our training. We always have to learn about all the new stuff that we get in. We got to get uh, learned up on it, um, so we can quickly and efficiently troubleshoot and fix whatever problem comes up out here, uh, regardless of 
how old or how new it is. If it's here, we should know about it, and we we get, we get the we get the job done. Lance Corporal Jared Fisk is our is our guest here today. I'm live from Afghanistan here on the talk station. And as we talk about this uh, again, uh, you are in a obviously a fl- forward deployed area in a combat zone in an area that you don't exactly uh, even with all your training, it's uh, it has to be a little bit different a different environment, different um, uh, weather conditions, everything else to try to keep that connectivity up. Uh, I would imagine it's uh, quite a challenge. It is. It is. Um, nothing we can handle, obviously. Uh, but it, it's, it is much different from back in the United States. Climate has a, it, it doesn't really have a big um, factor in how we handle things, but um, it's, it's just the basic fact of uh, where we are, how quickly it needs to be done. It's, it's all about mission accomplishment, so everything we do, is, uh, it goes towards mission accomplishment and there's always little bits of everything that factor into getting things done. I know when you put the second ball together or when you put this uh, particular forward deploy group together, it can be some different folks. Are you working with some of the same people that you worked with at Cherry Point? I am. I'm, I'm, I'm working with a few of them that I used to, that I worked with at Cherry Point, and there's also some new faces, which is nice. Get to, get a whole new look at everything. Um, so it, it's it's nice to see people from around the United States coming together, working together. Um, we we make a pretty good team out here. Uh, and again, uh, that that mission. I know that you stay focused on that mission. It's something that we're always impressed with, no matter where the Marine comes from. Is that they're pretty um, focused on what the job is before them, right? Yes, sir. We uh, mission accomplishment first, and then everything else comes afterwards. And and also, as you said, uh, here, from people from other bases, you get a fresh set of eyes. You get an idea of how things may have been done other places to solve problems, too. Yes, sir. It's uh, always nice to have other people's uh, sense. For instance, if I don't know something, and neither do the Marines from Cherry Point, we always have those other Marines to look forward to because they might, they might have come across this situation in another time and know the solution so it it we got answers coming from all directions now uh, when you uh, have you, has all your training in this area come from the marine corps or were you uh uh were you pretty familiar with a lot of internet and communications and computer operations before then <laughs> uh no sir i i believe i owned my first computer when i was around 16 years old so pretty much all of my training has come through the Marine Corps. Do you anticipate that this is something that, that you may want to stick with one day and when uh, uh, your time in the Corps is done? Possibly. Um, I mean, it's not my favorite subject, It's, but I, I do like learning new things, and I've learned a whole lot since I've been here, learned my job, been with the Marine Corps, so it's definitely an option. Um, but I'll keep it open, see what see what comes up well i can tell you that it skills as you can develop them are the are probably the most transferable thing you can do in this uh this society now so it definitely would be a a, a fallback position if nothing else well, well let's talk about what do you like i mean what is uh, something that uh that maybe you would uh, look forward to doing i'm a i'm a big outdoors guy i like working outdoors doing manual work i know it sounds kind of funny but my uh my father owns a landscaping business and i always liked working with him um the hours weren't the greatest but i loved getting out there we we installed irrigation systems and uh that was always a lot of fun got to travel around got we did uh irrigation systems on some golf courses so that it was uh it was just fun seeing how everything works out there and seeing the outcome of how the yard looks and how everything works, puts together. I would imagine that where you are right now, you could say, hey, we could use a little landscaping out here. Yes, yes sir. I, I, uh, I joke around with the Marines here that we could, that I could install a sprinkler system and hopefully get some grass within the next two months. <laughs> uh, Lance Corporal Jared Fisk uh, joining us from 2nd Marine Air Wing 4 to Camp Leatherneck in Afghanistan. 
here today. Uh, and talk a little bit about um, a contact with home. We mentioned about being able to be in contact, but what about as far as uh, the what that how important that is for the morale of you and your fellow Marines about hearing from home, you know, maybe getting that occasional letter or package, and coming up on the holidays, or what that will mean for you to uh, to hear from folks at home. Uh, we can't say enough on how much it means to hear from everybody back home. I know personally myself, I I always look for a uh, mail call just to see if I got any news from the rear. Um, those little phone calls, the little Skype sessions, they, they mean a lot because uh, being out here, you feel disconnected at some points. So when you hear them, hear their voice, see them, it's always, uh, it always brings you right back to home. So it's a, it's a big deal. Packages, uh, especially around the holidays, because that's usually a difficult time for a lot of people in deployed areas. But um, with all the resources we have out here, uh, we should be all set, and I can't wait to uh, see how their holidays go. Now, how long have you been out there? I've been out here for about three and a half months now. Oh, so it's still pretty new for you. Uh, is this a year deployment for you, or do you know? Uh, no, sir. Mine's about six and a half months. Mm-hmm. I'm only doing half a year. Okay, so you are even on the downside of that now. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get you back home here soon. What do you, What are you doing at downtime there? Uh, sleep. <laughs> that's that's a big one. Um, it's either because we uh, our hours they uh, they shift on whether we work so many or so little, but. With our downtime, it's usually just relaxing, uh, taking a breather. I try to communicate with the family, um, even catching up on a little bit of reading, checking on sports. So, And probably helping somebody else try to figure out how to work Skype if they can't figure it out. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's a, uh, again, we're so, so proud of the work that all of you do. Yeah, uh, you do amazing uh, service for our country and uh, for all the people, really, of the free people of the world, and what your your mission is there. Uh, do you get uh, uh, much feedback uh, coming from uh, forward bases, from other bases? Um, we well, we don't really get too much feedback. We get a lot of phone calls with issues that we try to deal with, and we try to teach the Marines out on those bases how to handle those situations, so they can do it right there on the spot instead of needing our help. But um, I say we do a pretty good job of that. Everyone out here in my MOS knows what they're doing. So it's it's just simple. It's just sometimes little things that people don't know that we can always help them out with. So. And uh, are you involved in communications along the flight line there too? Is that part of that? Uh, we are. We we support the flight line. We support all uh, aircraft communications as well. Um, so everything that that flies, lands, all the communication that they do, we assist in. Um, we assist the uh, communication center here for the Marine Corps Air Wing, Marine Aircraft Wing, and uh, we so we help them with airstrikes. We help them with medevacs. We we keep them up and running so they can get all those out running smoothly. Uh, once again, uh, speaking with uh, Lance Corporal Jared Fisk, uh, live from Afghanistan, and we want to thank you for joining us today. It's uh, been a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, I guess I, I might even have to root for the Patriots uh, over the Jets this coming Sunday night. I appreciate it, sir. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, Corporal, uh, thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. All right. Uh, our next guest is uh, joining us uh, today. is uh, is uh, Sergeant Major Henry Pruch, who joins us live from Afghanistan as we talk about Marine Corps birthday being celebrated all around the world today. Sergeant Major, thank you for being with us today. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 
Well, we're uh, glad to have you with us here today. And, uh, you know, your uh, former sec def, uh, uh, William Cohen, was just on with us right before. But when I saw your name pop up on the screen that you're ready, I had to get rid of him. You know, we had to go ahead and move right to you because this is much more important. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. He's not, he's not still on the line hearing this, so don't worry about it. Uh, but, uh, again, this is a special day, the birthday of the Marine Corps, and we did want to find out about how your Marines are doing and how – uh, how you are commemorating this day. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, today's uh, 236 uh, years of the Marine Corps. Uh, November 10th is our uh, birthday, and uh, so it's, uh, it's a great time to celebrate it here in Afghanistan and uh, during combat operations. And a uh, matter of fact, about uh, an hour ago, we had a cake cutting ceremony here in the compound with the uh, commanding general, uh, Major General Walters. And uh, that's traditionally how we celebrate uh, the Marine Corps uh, birthday is with a cake cutting ceremony. The oldest Marine president gets a piece of cake, and the youngest Marine president gets a piece of cake. Yeah, we saw the ceremony from Cherry Point uh, that was also uh, went on yesterday from that. I believe the youngest Marine was just turning 19, uh, like uh, in the next couple of days or this next week or so. Uh, how about on your end? How about the oldest and youngest Marine in a deployment? Yep, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, our youngest Marine uh, was 19 also. Our oldest Marine was 51. Oh, excellent. So that's uh, quite a span. Yeah, and again, a lot of experience in the, that goes along with that as well. Uh, so, uh, again, what does it mean uh, to be in a deployed, a forward deployed area like this uh, when the Marine Corps birthday comes around? Well, you know, it's uh, it, it's special. Usually, back in uh, in the when we're back in the states, you know, we get all dressed up and go to the Marine Corps ball with our wives, uh, girlfriends, husbands, you know, whatever. And uh, it's it's a ceremony that's uh, you know it's nice and uh, but being here, it's it, it's a lot different. Uh, it means I think a lot more. You've got all the Marines together here, and and uh, it's more intimate uh, of a ceremony. And uh, you really get to think about uh, the Marines that went before you and fought wars before you and, and uh, how important it is to carry on that legacy. Uh, and it is. Uh, you stand on a lot of uh, wonderful shoulders and broad shoulders from the past there, too. And, and uh, you know, we've talked with a number of Marines, and one of the things that we always hear about uh, is that is that they are uh, pretty well informed about uh, the history of the Marine Corps and what it means and what kind of traditions that they serve and they also are very proud of those traditions. And even, uh, and it's great to hear that even in a deployed area like this, uh, you can you can still stand up and and be proud to, to be a United States Marine. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, even out in the outer uh, forward operating bases, you know, they'll take a the time, and uh, it might not be as uh, nice as yeah. cake as you would have back <laughs> in the states, but they'll they'll put something together and do a ceremony. Absolutely. Okay, uh, and again, uh, obviously remaining focused on your mission as well uh, there as we speak with uh, Sergeant Major Henry Pruch. Uh And uh, how long have you been in the Marine Corps? It'll be uh, 29 years this December. Oh, that's, that's great. Uh, and so you're you're nearing that 30 mark. Is that going to be a, a farewell tour then? Well, we, we'll see how it all uh, turns <laughs> out, but... Uh, uh, if it has to be, it, it, it's been, uh, I couldn't think of anything better to do uh, with my life, and uh, I enjoyed every second of it. Well, it's, uh, it obviously is uh, true with you, and it comes through in what you say to us uh, today. Uh, and as the uh, Sergeant Major, um, uh, tell, me, what, tell me about your Marines. I know you, th- you take it very personally uh, about them um, and about how they're doing in this, in this field, in this operation. Yeah, absolutely. I tell you, the the Marines make me very proud. Uh, they do uh, tremendous things uh, every day. Uh, and here in this environment for the uh, Afghanistan's uh, people, you know, they, they go above and beyond. And, and I think what's great about these young Marines that we have, most of them have joined after uh, 9-11. Yes. And so that really says a lot about their character and, and uh, their patriotism, all that. And, uh, you know, they, they, these uh, Marines here are, uh, you know, continuing that long legacy that we've had as Marines, and uh, I'm very proud of them. 
Uh, as well, you should be. Again, we're all proud of the, the job that you're doing out there as uh, our Marines and sailors uh, in our forward areas like this. Now, uh, how long have you been deployed at this time, and do you have uh, do you have an end date for you? We do. We're, we're here on a one-year deployment. We've been here a little more than eight months now. Uh, so we'll be uh, heading back to the Cherry Point area at the uh, end of February. And uh, so the the biggest part of the deployment's uh, over with, and uh, we're starting to see the little light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, as you um, continue those operations there, too, uh, we do talk about uh, a lot of things, uh, but we always ask, it's kind of a standard question, we always find out, how's the food? The food's good. <laughs> I'll tell you, it, it it can always be worse. Uh, the food is not too bad, uh, to be honest. Yeah, well, we've heard about some special nights and uh, different things that are offered in the base, and that sounds pretty good to us. So, uh, again, we're just uh, we 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 do get a chance to talk to people of a lot of different generations, and you know, having been in uh, 29 years now, uh, that things have changed over the years. What do you think has been one of the most positive changes that you've seen over this time? Well, you know, I, I I think honestly, the all volunteer force has has just been a great change for the, all the services. But uh, you know, especially in Marine Corps, I, I think it says a lot when you get uh, young men and women that are, are volunteers, and uh, they want to do it, they want to be here, and it's really about service. Uh, you know, you, you don't make a lot of money uh, coming into the military, and. Uh, so they really do it for the right reasons, and I think that's been a, the biggest and one of the, the greatest uh, benefits that we've had probably in the last, you know, 20, 30 years in the military. Again, amen, and I've had, had a chance to interview people from all services, but uh, I have to say that some, there are some folks that are just born to be Marines, and they grow up, and that's, what, that's their desire, that's what they want to do. I mean, it's not just a, an option or some sort of thing to do. It is, uh, it is driven. Uh, and to have Marines that are driven as as your Marines are is a is a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, again, we want to thank uh, Sergeant Major Henry Pruch for joining us this morning from the Second Marine Air Wing Forward, and uh, we appreciate you being with us on the Marine Corps birthday on this special day, especially live from Afghanistan. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, again, I just want to say real quick, uh, thanks for the support. We feel it every day out here. And I uh, just want to uh, have a shout-out there to my wife, Jen, and uh, my young son, Nathaniel. Thank you. Great, great. Again, uh, Sergeant Major Henry Proust joining us. And from Newman, Georgia, Staff Sergeant Christopher McGaw joins us. He's a Georgia Bulldog fan and a Falcon fan on Fox Sports Radio. Staff Sergeant, good morning, sir. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks a lot for coming on. Tell us about your job, how long you've been over there at Camp Leatherneck, and what your day looks like in front of you today. Uh, we've been here for about three months. I'm actually the uh, division staff NCUIC uh, overseeing uh, operations here in the airframes department, ensuring parts go out to the aircraft uh, for good serviceability, making sure that all the aircraft stay up and flying from the parts that we produce out to ensure the Marines on the front line are getting the air support that they need. An amazing, amazing and responsible job considering how many missions are going on and how many planes and helicopters and all the you know, air, tra air transportation that comes back in front of you and goes out every day. I'm sure that's a really important job where you've got a lot of good people above you and underneath you, huh? Yes, sir. Very good crew we have here. Well, tell me about your background. What was your decision, sir, to become a Marine? When did that life-changing moment happen for you? What were you doing before, and how did, why did you decide to do that at this stage in your life? I was just going, to, uh, going through high school and decided really nothing much more to do. This was back in 1999 before anything was going on. I just knew I wanted to go out and serve my uh, country. I had few relatives that have background in military, so 
figured it would be the best option for me to go out and just do something different and get out and see the world. And then September 11th happened, and how did that change your life after we jumped into the war in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, is this your first tour? Were you in Iraq before you got to Afghanistan? Uh, I've been, I've had a uh, boat deployment into Iraq. Uh, this is actually my first tour in Afghanistan. I've done several other deployments in other places around the world. Well, it sounds like you've gotten everything out of it. You've traveled the world, you're protecting the country, and you're still there in harm's way and in a very important moment in American history. Yes, sir. It's definitely uh, been a good 12 years for me. All right. We're talking to Staff Sergeant Christopher McGaw here on Fox Sports Radio. Let's talk sports. I see you're an Atlanta Falcons fan. you got a lot of confidence in Matt Ryan, Tony Gonzalez, Michael Turner, and the rest of the defense. You've been close getting into the playoffs the last couple of years, but coming up short. Absolutely. Uh, Any time that they air the games over here, I stay up to watch them. Uh, it's been a little rocky start for them. Uh, looks like uh, a few key injuries with Roddy White and Julio Jones getting some injuries. We have all the weapons there. I just, I think uh, overall the defense is slacking a little bit, but I think they're turning around here late in the uh, season. I see you're a Georgia Bulldog fan. How passionate are you about the Bulldogs, especially the rival against Florida? And we were talking before you came on about the big battle between LSU and Alabama. How closely do you follow SEC football in Afghanistan? I follow SEC football to the best of my ability. Any games that are on, I will be watching them. Bulldogs, I'm very, very passionate about. Who would you rather see lose more, LSU or Alabama this Saturday? Uh, it, that's a tough one. Uh, I I would like to see LSU win over Alabama, but that's just that's just my personal. I, that SEC rivalries are always great games, so I I think it's going to be a very tight, close game. No doubt about it. I agree with you. Staff Sergeant, before you go, please say hello to any member of your family, anyone close to you. We'll make sure they get a copy of this. I just want to say hi to my wife and kids, Kim, Neil, Haley. I love you. And hi to my mom, Peggy. Uh, hope to see you all soon. How old are your kids, sir? Twelve and eight. God bless you for your service. Thanks for doing this. Be safe. We hope to talk to you when you come back and we can talk SEC football again. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it.